the orbitals. And so my answer was this. You know, there, there are actually how many quantum numbers total? So far we've only talked about three quantum numbers, but there are actually four quantum numbers. And um, three quantum numbers are all you need to define an orbital. In fact, all orbitals are defined by three quantum numbers. The fourth quantum number just tells you what the spin state of the electron is in that orbital. And so the fourth quantum number is if you have an electron in the orbital, how is that electron oriented? And it turns out there are two orientations that an electron can take. But the orbital itself is only defined by three quantum numbers, n, l, and m. And so we'll need the fourth one when we start putting electrons in, but we haven't put any electrons in, so I, I haven't talked about the fourth quantum number at all. I'm going to start talking about it today, though. And so essentially, it, it, one way of thinking about the quantum numbers is the quantum numbers is the address. For example, if somebody said, I have a 2p electron, you know, well, 2p electron, there are three orbitals in there. Which of the three orbitals is that 2p electron in? And so with the quantum numbers, we have three unique addresses for the three unique p orbitals. We could call it px, py, pz. Uh, but the origin of the px, py, pz comes from the m equals 1, m equals 0, and m equals minus 1. And so that's what we have. So uh, we left off, and then we can figure these out. You know, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 2, 1. Minus 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1. Here are the four. And so we call this the 2s. These three orbitals here would be the two p's. And each one of the two p's has a unique address. The 1s is only one of those. Up here, we have the nine orbitals. So the, uh, n equals 3. Or no. we're going to have the 3, 2, minus 2, 3, 2, minus 1, 3, 2. 0, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 2. These orbitals we call the 3D orbitals. And so we'll have those. One thing we notice is this. The subshells in a given shell, and so this would be called the n equals 2 shell. n equals 2 has two subshells. These two subshells have the exact same energy. And they're energetically determined. Even though the shapes of the electron clouds are totally different, the, we know what's the same. Even though the shapes are totally different, what's the same between these two subshells? The effective distance. The effective distance, the effective distance is going to dictate the energy. You know, the closer the electron gets to the nucleus, the lower in energy, you know, the more stable it is, the stronger the attraction. The further it gets from the nucleus, you know, the less stable, the higher energy that electron must be in order to pull away from the nucleus. And so uh, the effective distance is the same. And we can say something about this because, you know, the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d are energetically degenerate. And uh, that tells us that, again, even though the shapes, the probability distributions are different, then when we normalize the effective distance in three dimensions, you know, what we call isotropically, um, the effective distance is the is the same. <clears throat> All right, this is the hydrogen atom. Not only does this work for the hydrogen atom, but this works for, you know, here's the n equals 1 shell all the way up to the n equals infinity shell. Um, not only does this work for the hydrogen atom, but this also works for other one electron species. <coughs> There's certain changes for other one electron species. For example, what other changes would you expect if you're dealing with other one electron species? One, you expect a change in the energy. You know, E sub n is, you've got to add in the uh, this term here, minus z squared r sub h over n squared, where z is the charge in the nucleus. And so let's say if we're looking at a species like this, if we're looking at helium plus, helium plus has two protons and one electron, also two neutrons, but we're going to ignore the neutrons right now. There are different isotopes of helium, so the number of neutrons can vary. But anyway, we have two protons that are fixed, one electron. What's that going to do? Now we have two protons, 
how, how strongly is that electron going to be attracted? In hydrogen, we have one proton. In helium, we have two protons. So what's the difference in the electrical attraction? So it's going to be stronger in? In helium plus. It's going to be stronger in helium plus because helium has more what we call nuclear charge. And what that does is it pulls the electron in closer. And so what, what that means is that helium has electron on a tighter leash. The electron can't get as far away. And so what that does is it shrinks the 1s orbital. And so the 1s orbital in helium is actually smaller and if it's smaller it's actually lower in energy. And so helium is going to have a lower energy 1s orbital and a smaller 1s orbital because of that. But otherwise, you know, the, the diagram looks exactly the same. It's just shifted down and the orbitals are smaller for a given, you know, for a given set. But otherwise, um, you know, looks the same, the orbitals look the same. But when we get to multi electron species, we lose the degeneracy of the sublevels. One of the biggest differences that you'll see between a multi electron and a single electron species is the subshell degeneracy is lost. So how, how could that be? You know, um, how could it be? Because, uh, for example, here, if I look at the 1s, you know, this is still 100, 1001s are interchangeable. But now when I look at the 2s versus the 2p, the 2p are still degenerate. These 2p's have the same energy, but what we lose is the degeneracy between the 2s and the 2p here. And so now we have an energy gap that, that is the energy of the 2p is slightly higher than the energy of the 2s. There's a gap. And so we see these are no longer the same energy. And this pattern's repeated. When we go up to the 3s, you know, the 3s is here. And then the 3p is going to be here, higher in energy. And so again, the 3p higher in energy than the 3s. And something weird happens here for some of these. Uh, that is, the 4s dips below the 3d. I'm setting these aside here, so you know, so now. Take a look. The 4s is the 400 orbital. And so what's going on here, you know, is not only are we losing degeneracy here, now we're getting kind of mixing of the shells because the 4s was in the, the n equals 4 shell. Now it's dropped down into what looks like the n equals 3 shell. And the 4p is here. 4p. And so where are the 4ds? The 4ds are up here. And so now we have a slightly different um, definition. I mean, over here the shells are so easy. You know, the first shell, the second shell, the third shell. Over here it's, it's okay. The first shell is okay, right? But what about the second shell? Well, the second shell is still okay. Maybe I shouldn't it shouldn't drop. But the second shell consists of the 2s and the 2p. But what about the third shell? When we look at the third shell, I see the 3s and the 3p, but now the 3ds are mixed up in the fourth shell. And so the way we're going to define shells is a little differently for the multi electron species. For the multi electron species, the shell is just going to be a group of closely spaced or closely related in terms of energy orbitals. And so the first shell consists of the 1s, the second shell consists of the 2s and the 2p. Uh, this isn't the greatest drawing here. But, uh, 2s and the 2p. The third shell, 3s and the 3p. The fourth shell consists of this. And so this would be the first shell. 
the second shell, third shell, fourth shell. We get this. So we lose the degenerate speed, and then we get this kind of mix up here in the orbitals. And so what accounts for it? Well, what accounts for this uh, is the same thing. The reason why the three Ds popped up there and the four S's popped down here and the four P's popped down here is the same reason the two S and the two P are no longer degenerate. And uh, that, that happens to be um, this here. Subshell degeneracy is lost because of, well, it doesn't make sense because the effective distance is the same, right? So if the effective distance is still the same, the effective distance didn't change. It's still the same. And so what the difference is is a little bit tricky. The difference is because of something called um, penetration and shielding. Penetration and shielding. Okay, just because the effective distance is here, you know, we we got to look at statistically where do we see the electron. And the easiest way to see penetration and shielding is by looking at the RPDs. Let's take a look at the RPDs since um, this isn't working. I'm going to just try to draw these up on the board here. Or in a different way. One thing uh, that we get from the RPD is this. Do you guys remember what the RPD is? This is on page 337. Yeah, radial probability distribution. Yeah, and one thing is the peak. You know, the peak in the RPD, this is a 1S orbital. In a 1s or 1 0 0 orbital, we see a peak right, out here. Why isn't the peak right at the nucleus? You know, because in a 1s orbital, the highest probability is finding the electron right at the nucleus. Because uh, the concentration of the volume. Right, yeah. We're looking. This is a maxim. This, this curve is generated by maximizing what? The distance from the nucleus. Uh, the density. probability density, the electron cloud density, and the volume, yeah, then, then that's correct. But so we, we have this. This is called the most, most probable distance. <laughs> most probable. Hmm? Yeah, kind of where they intersect. This is the most probable distance. But is there some probability it could be found? Um, actually, this is not the great. Let me let me adjust this curve here. Is there some probability it can be found next to the nucleus? Yeah, yeah. There's probability here. When we look at the probability, you know, there's probability that it could be close to the nucleus. You know, this probability we call um, sorry, we call this uh, penetration. Penetration just means that uh, there's probability of being close to the nucleus. So what we say about the 1s orbital is a 1s orbital is a uh, penetrating orbital because there's some probability it can be found uh, close, close to the nucleus. All right, now we're going to go and look at a 2s and a 2p orbital. So uh, here, the 2s. We want to compare the 2s and the 2p orbital to C. And so looking at a 2s, we've got to recall there's a node here. This. Let me try to draw a node here, like, like this right here. 
And it turns out the most probable distance is out here, and then it drops out. And so we see that uh, the 2s is somewhat penetrating because there's some probability that the electron can be close to the close to the nucleus. But its most probable distance is kind of away from the nucleus. Okay, then let's look at the 2p. The 2p orbital is going to look like this. As you recall, the 2p orbital has a, uh, you know, Sorry, I turn this off. Turn it off. Okay, so the 2p orbital has a higher probability that it's closer to the nucleus here, right? You know, it's, it's the most probable distance a little closer to the nucleus. Both of these have the same effective distance. Why? Even though, if you compare this, the 2p looks like it's closer to the nucleus than the 2s. Doesn't it? Yeah, the 2p looks like it's closer to the nucleus, the most probable distance, but yet they have the same effective distance. How could that be? Yeah, we have to normalize it over 3d, right? Because the 2p is what we call an isotropic or an isotropic. Orbital. Isotropic means the same in three dimensions. And isotropic means it's different in. I'm sorry? The fancy terminology? And isotropic and isotropic. And isotropic and isotropic. The reason I'm introducing fancy terminology like this, which isn't even in your book is because they're very common. And once you start doing more um, science, you're going to start hearing them a lot. So you aren't, you aren't necessarily responsible for it. You know, I'm not going to test you on that, on those words, the big words. But we might as well start getting used to using them. That's the reason why. Okay. And so what is it? This is isotropic mean. Isotropic means it's the same in three dimensions, whereas anisotropic means it's different depending on which direction you look at. And so, you know, um, so what we do is we spread out the charge uh, density that is the electron cloud over three dimensions, and we get the same, you know, effective distance. Right? We talked about this last time, so this is just a review. Now. That's okay. You know, I look at the probable distances, but one thing I notice is this. What do you notice here? Yes. Yeah. And so we call this the 2s a more penetrating orbital. This one is less penetrating orbital. Well, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because both of them have the same effective distance. So if both of them have the same effective distance, then it doesn't really matter which one's more penetrating, which one's less, right? Because on average, it's going to be the same, correct? Where it makes a difference is when we have something called shielding. Now, um, when we have shielding, what happens is this. We have, let's say we have some um, 1s electrons in here. If there's 1s electrons present, let's write in this. So I'm going to, this doesn't to scale. 1s electrons going to look like this. This is 1s. is a 1s. If there are 1s electrons present, then what happens is those 1s electrons block or shield some of the positive charge from the 
S or the 2p electrons. And so essentially what we have here is this is called shielding. Shielding. And what shielding is, is it's shielding of nuclear charge Shielding is this blocking or, or shielding of nuclear charge. I'll say blocking of nuclear charge. <clears throat> by inner electrons. Inner meaning a 1s if you're a 2s. Anything further in towards the nucleus would be an inner electron. All right, so even though both of these have the same effective, and the one's more probable distance is closer, the other is a little farther out, they, they both are, are, are different in terms of how much nuclear charge the typical electron sees. And so let's say you're an electron here, or an electron here, and you have to contend with these electrons here, an electron here. What you want to see is you want to see Z. Z is what? Z is the nuclear charge, how many protons you have. But because of shielding and penetration, you don't see the full Z. You know, some of the Z, the proton charge is blocked. Well, this is like, if you're trying to block somebody from getting to the nucleus, you know, you're trying to block somebody from getting to the nucleus. So these are both equal, these 1s, 1s is pretty equal in terms of blocking because there's going to be some effective distance and most probable distance. You know, it's got the probability cloud. And so the block, blocker is the same. But, you know, the electrons are different. An electron in a 2s is more, what would you say, versus an electron in a 2p. Which one do you think is easier to block from seeing the nucleus? The 2p electron or the 2s? The 2p electron is going to be a lot easier to block from seeing the nucleus because it can't sneak in like this. You know, a 2s can sneak in here and get close to the nucleus. And let's say you're blocking this, but all of a sudden the 2s is over there, right next to the nucleus. And if it's, if it's over there, it's not going to be shielded. It's going to see the full nuclear charge. So if this electron's here, this electron peaks in over here, it's not shielded, right? Whereas over here, can this electron really sneak in there? No. And so this is uh, what we say um, for this electron. The 2s electron is better penetrating or more penetrating, less shielded. The um, 2p electron is less penetrating more shielded. And we can quantify this by looking at how much um, effective nuclear charge that electron sees. And so the way we quantify this is by something called Z effective. Z effective. We know that it's not going to see the full charge because of this shielding. And so how much does this block? Well, compared to how much does this block? And that we're going to see that the Z effectives are going to be different. That is, the Z effective for the 2s electron is going to be greater than the Z effective. This is going to be greater than the Z effective of the 2p electron. This is uh, smaller. 
And the more positive charge that electron sees, the more stable it is because of the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative. And so this is what gives rise. Uh, that means if Z effective is smaller, that means it's less stabilized. It's going to be higher in energy. Not significantly, just a little bit higher in energy. And so this is why we lose the degeneracy. That is, the 2s electron versus the 2p electron. They're close, but the 2p is slightly higher in energy just slightly higher. I mean, it's not a huge difference compared to 1s. 1s is way down here, so these are tightly spaced, slightly higher. And then when we go to the 3s, we see the same pattern. Then the 3d, d orbitals, are they very penetrating? You know, when we compare the d orbitals, um, if you look at the RDF of the d orbitals, like the 3D. Actually, we'll just compare it right now. Uh, let's put them all on the same graph. And so if we look at the 3S, the 3S are going to look like this. And then we'll go to the 3P. Let's get a different color. Okay, you look at these, and then you say, "Okay, which one is the um, which one is the most penetrating?" The three S, sure. Three S, followed by the three P, followed by the three D. Three D is not very penetrating because of, uh, and so uh, the three D. Well, what about the four S? What do you think? The four S are going to be more penetrating than actually the the 3D, which means that we get this strange pattern. And the strange pattern is this. The 4S actually come first before the 3D. And so it comes like this, 4S to 3D, and then to 4P, which is just slightly higher in energy. And so this is why we get these shells like this. Three D is more penetrating than four P. Three D is more penetrating than four P. Yes. Four P is going to be slightly higher in energy. Uh, the other way of thinking about it is three D is less penetrating than four S. It sh you know it, it should be below four S. It just popped up there and it just happened to light right here. Mm -hmm. So the 2s shield the 2p? Yes. The 2s can shield the 2p as well. But <clears throat> there's differences. You know, there's differences between same shell and inner shell shielding. Inner shell shielding is highly effective, it's pretty much a one to one. And so if I have inner shell shielding, Let's write that in some sign here. Inner shell shielding. 
is highly effective. And so a 1s really is good at blocking the charge from a 2s or 2p. You know, very effective. And so inner shell shielding is highly effective. Same shell shielding. It is much less so. So about one to one, you know, for every inner shell electron, we lose one positive charge, and so it blocks it. So you have an inner shell electron, and it's going to take out one of the positive charges in the nucleus. Same shells, like more like thirty percent of the charge or less, you know, is blocked of the Z. And so actually, there's a homework problem. In which I let me just check that. In which we calculate this, but it's not until the next chapter. Fortunately. And so we'll see this chapter ten homework problem. Where you're gonna calculate. We can calculate Z effective, you know, just by applying some simple rules. It's not a perfect calculation. But it's pretty good at estimating how much charge is blocked. It's in chapter ten. All right. Uh, well, how do you how do you remember? Uh, you know, how do you know which one? You know, how how could I figure this out? You know, how could I figure out that three D is more penetrating than four P, but less penetrating than four S? How could I figure that out? How you figure it out is you memorize it. I mean, this is just a memorized type deal. Yeah, but you know, there's some patterns that people use to help them memorize. One of the patterns that people use to help them memorize is, is this pattern, the pyramid pattern. And that is 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. 3s, 3p, what comes next? 3d, 4s, 4p, 4g, 4f, 5s, 5p, 5g, 5f, 5g, ECDFG. So, so this is a pattern. Um, the pattern in the energies we can get from here, it goes 1s first, 2s, followed by 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, etc. And then you have to know where to cut it off for the shells. This is just memorization. First shell stops here. Second shell stops here. Third shell stops here. Fourth shell stops here. Fifth shell stops somewhere. <laughs> Actually, we'll find it, figure it out. Uh, actually, you should know this to, you should be able to draw this and know this to the fourth shell. Memorize the diagram to the fourth shell. What did we call this diagram here? We called it a energy level diagram. <laughs> The good thing about an energy level diagram is you see the relative energies. For example, you know when I look at the relative energies, here's the 1s here. And then there should be a big jump to the 2. And then a smaller jump to the 3. And a smaller jump to the 4. So you get the relative spacings of the energy. And so know how to draw this. Right? Memorize this pattern. Memorize this pattern. Because I can guarantee you that this pattern will be on the test. I'm going to ask you to draw this. So there's easy points there. Right? Easy points, but every semester a lot of people end up losing a lot of points. They don't have it memorized. 
Hmm? Yeah, right. Including the lines. Like yeah, the, uh, let me give you. Separated. Right, right. Let me give you examples where people screw up. You know, they screw up. Like, for example, they draw one line for the 4P, right? They screw up. Or they put the 3D down here. Or they give me the hydrogen atom when I ask for multi electron. Sometimes I ask for both hydrogen atom and multi electron. Probably the biggest screw up is with the with, you know to get these orders mixed up, but you don't have to worry about the order because you get the order from this. So like, up to yeah, up to the fourth. What do they call it for the fourth? Subshell. Not subshell. Close. The fourth. Close. Subshell's close. Shell. Fourth shell. Each of these is a subshell, the 4S subshell, the 4P subshell, the 3D subshell. They're only, you know, this is screwed up because remember the law of subshells we talked about? Remember the law of subshells? The law of subshells, unfortunately, is only valid for the hydrogen atom or what we call the energy level. The N equals whatever energy level. N equals 4. N equals four energy level is going to have four orbitals, or four subshells, sorry, not orbitals. Here, uh, it doesn't quite work out because we have we only have three subshells in the fourth shell. You see that? Yeah. And so fortunately, the, the, the law of subshells doesn't work out. So maybe we should modify the law of subshells and call it the law of N, the law of N. There are n subshells in n energy level. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, start adding the electrons to this. Well, let's go ahead and do that. When we're dealing with electrons now, add electrons to our uh, energy level diagram. When we're adding electrons, then we have the fourth quantum number we have to deal with. What is the fourth quantum number? The fourth quantum number is called S or M sub S. It's also a magnetic in its origin. That's the previous one. Well, I, actually, I didn't say that earlier. Forget what I just said. It's not important. Just know the symbol. And there are two values. It could be plus one half or minus one half. Plus one half we represent with an arrow. So it turns out that quantum mechanics says that these electrons act as little magnets. They have spin associated with them. This is derived from quantum mechanics. Moving electrons will generate a magnetic field as well, but these magnets um, just originate from the electron itself. Yeah. And so uh, it could either be spin up, north pole up, or spin down, like this. Those are two. These are the only two spin orientations we can have. There's a famous experiment called the Stern Gerlach experiment, in which they determine this experimentally. You know, in Stern Gerlach, they shot silver atoms through a magnet. And some of the silver atoms said, like this, spin up, and they were deflected like this. Others said, spin down, they are deflected like this. So we got two deflection patterns in a fixed magnetic field, depending on how the magnet interact, interacted with the individual atoms. And so it only turns out there are two spin states here. And then we have something called the Pauli exclusion principle. Well, let's talk about that first because that deals with the spin quantum numbers. Well, all the Pauli exclusion principle says is that no two electrons in the same atom. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know it already. In the same atom can have the same set of 
for quantum members. What this means is that um, it sets a maximum orbital occupancy. of two electrons. And they have to have opposite spins. So um, if we have one electron, does this violate the Pauli exclusion principle? No. Is the Pauli exclusion principle the only thing we look at when we're filling orbitals? No, we look at other things too. And so what are the other things we look at? We look at uh, something called the off bow principle. The off bow principle, you know what it says? For ground state, you know what ground state means? Yeah, ground state means lowest energy. For ground state, what we call electron configurations. That is how you just fill these, electron configurations. Fill the lowest energy orbitals first. This is look, common sense. Fill the lowest energy orbitals first. So if I did this, Rather than putting the one electron in the one S, let's put it in the two S here. Does this violate the Pauli exclusion? No, but what this does is it violates the off out principle. This we would call an excited state. Okay, and so let's say that. Otherwise, it would be an excited state. Excited state is no problem. You know, for example, if there was an electron down here, I could make it pop up to here by exciting it. In fact, that's what you have to do. Do you remember in the hydrogen lamp, we had to get the electrons excited up here so they drop down and release light. And so excited states are no problem. You know, we could excite, in fact, we could excite the electron all the way from down here to the top. What happens if we excite an electron from down here to the top? We've lost that electron. Losing electrons called ionization. And so we get excited to the top. No problem. All right, that's the off out principle, Pauli exclusion principle. And then um, we need another one, which I thought was asking about, and that's Hun's rule. Hun's rule just says it turns out that um, for energetically degenerate orbitals, we want to fill them, fill energetically degenerate orbitals one at a time with parallel spin. Spin. This will give you the lower energy. So that happens like when I'm filling the 2p orbitals here. If I fill these, I want to fill them one at a time. Does it matter which one I fill first? No, it doesn't because there's no real difference. I mean, if you think about an atom rotating, the x-axis is always rotating one way or the other, right? So whatever is convenient. If I fill the middle one first, there's no problem. That doesn't violate anything because they're all equivalent. They're just orthogonal to each other. In fact, the electron's not going to know the, the x-axis is different than the z-axis, is it? But where do I put the second electron? 
In the same orbital? No. no. I don't put the electron in the same orbital. Why do you think that is? Um, why, why would you want to do that? Well, it's Hans rule, but why, why does... Electrons want to prevent the occupation of another electron next to it because of the detraction? Yes. So, yeah. Repulsions. Repul because of the energy, right? And so you don't put an electron here because both electrons have negative charge and the, there's going to be electrical repulsion. So you want to put it in another orbital. But the thing is, why do you put it, well, shouldn't we put it anti-parallel spin? Because, you know, when you're pl playing with magnets, you know, it, it seems to be more stable, right, to have north oriented with south. Because if you put a north and a north pole together, they repel each other, right? And so this is a little weird. But it turns out this is more stable than putting them anti-parallel. And so we put them like that. All right. So um, let's fill these. Uh, uh, well, actually, let's just look at some electrons. And you tell me the quantum numbers. Here. What are the quantum numbers for that? There are four quantum numbers that define an electron. <coughs> Four one zero positive. Four one zero positive. Yeah, good. That's right. And so, with those four quantum numbers, the first three pinpoint the orbital, right? The last quantum number tells us, yeah, the orientation, the spin orientation. And so, let's pick another one. Let's do this one here. What are the four quantum numbers for this one? Close. Four, two, two. Um, three, four, two is wrong because this is three. Four, one is a uh, three, one is wrong because this is a three, one. This is the three, one series. So this is going to be three, two, 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 negative a half. That's correct. Three, two, two, negative a half. Good. <coughs> well, they, on tests, I don't. Sometimes I'll ask you to write the quantum numbers for all the electrons, but usually it's too much. Sometimes I'll just say pick two. Tell me. You want to see the data, but probably what would help is if we wrote the quantum numbers here. This would be 100, zero, zero, 200, zero, zero, 300, zero, zero, 400. Do you see the one reason for writing it in this pattern is, is so we could do this. This would be a 2, 1, negative 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 3, 1, negative 1, 3, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1. 4, 1, negative 1, 4, 1, 0, 4, 1, 1, 3, 2, negative 2, 3, 2, negative 1, you know, etc. And so we keep the, the pattern. So we can see vertically it's the same here. We just change the n as we go up. All right, now let's start filling the um, orbitals. So hydrogen is going to be, is this okay for hydrogen? Yeah, that would be a one zero zero, one half plus one half. Is this okay for hydrogen? No. What would that violate? What would that violate? Nothing. This is fine for hydrogen. In fact, in empty space, let's say there's no magnet, there's no Earth's magnetic field. In empty space, does the hydrogen know if it's upside, right side up or upside down? Is there any such thing as upside, yeah, upside down? No, there's no such thing. The only time you're going to be upside down is if you put some external reference in there. So the only time this will know it's upside down is if you flip on a magnet. If you flip on a magnet, then all of a sudden the hydrogen knows, am I oriented with that magnet or am I not? And so the Earth's magnetic field, you know, Earth's magnetic field is oriented like this, with the, the north pole of the magnet is the south pole, 
and the south pole of the magnet is at the north pole. So, you know, we have magnets here. The magnets, you know, like a compass, will want to orient the north pole of the compass with the south pole of the Earth's magnetic field, which is at the north pole. Does that make sense? And so the only time the compass knows, if there's no Earth's magnetic field, does the compass know which direction is north? No. And so the same thing here. Um, however, we can flip on a magnet. It's no problem. Flip on a magnet and then see. There's going to be there's going to be a difference. And so this will be hydrogen. Um, just convention, as we pointed out. Helium. This is helium. Two electron. Helium. You know, the question was asked earlier. You know, is there shielding? Yeah, there's going to be shielding, but you know, these are empty orbitals here. These two orbitals are going to be different in energy because if this electron gets popped up here. Where, where, if it gets popped up here versus popped up here, you know, it turns out this is going to be lower in energy because this orbital is more penetrating. And so this is helium, but now lithium, we have a choice. The electron three can go in the 2s or the 2p. We're going to stick with the uh, off bow and say we're going to put it in the more penetrating orbital. And so that would be lithium, right? And then beryllium. And then boron, we have a choice, any of these three. Boron, carbon, nitrogen. This is, a, this is what we call, you know what we call this? We call this a half-filled half -filled subshell. Now, is a half-filled subshell isotropic or anisotropic? In other words, if you cut a pie in half, I cut a pie in half, would that be isotropic or anisotropic? Okay. Anisotropic, right? And so if we cut the subshell in half, we expect anisotropic, is that right? Yeah. And so this, this subshell is cut in half. Is it anisotropic or isotropic? Well, it turns out there's two ways of cutting the pie. Well, a cake. Let's say a cake because it's more symmetric. We could cut the cake in half like this, which would result in an isotropic. Or we could cut the cake like this, remove this, and that would be isotropic. It would retain its what we call spherical symmetry. Isotropic is called spherical symmetry. And spherical symmetry is important for orbitals and for nature itself because what do you think is more stable? Being lopsided like this or being spherically symmetric like this? Spherically symmetric. So that lopsidedness creates, and so there's additional stabilization in, um, in this. But these are, these are filled. Uh, this is always spherically. S orbitals are always spherically. Even if it's in half, it's still just a sphere, right? Okay, now, um, that's going to come into play later, but let's talk about this. Okay, this is nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Now what we've done is we've filled the shell. When we fill the second shell, do you know what symmetry it has? Is that spherically symmetric or is it non-spherically? It's spherically. When you fill the shell, let's say there's a piece missing here. If there's a piece missing there, is it balanced? And no, it's not. And so this is going to create a higher energy situation than if we just complete it. When we complete it, then these three p orbitals are orthogonal to each other. When you have three filled p orbitals like this, we call it spherically symmetric, even though it's not really a sphere, right? But it's even in all dimensions. The S's are always like that. And so we've completed the S and the P. This is called a filled shell. Filled shells are especially stable. Especially stable. And so neon has a filled shell configuration. Now we have um, another definition. Another definition is valent shell versus core shell. Core shell is, you guys should already know this, core electrons are inner electrons. So this would be the core. This would be the valence. Now the valence shell is filled. 
When the valence shell is filled, it's like a core. You know, the core is complete. Now, this valence shell, if this valence shell is not filled like this, then yeah, the valence shell is incomplete, right? But when we complete that valence shell, it's like a core. And so when we complete this, it's like neon. So that's like having two cores. You know what I mean? Well, now, no, it changes because the valence is defined as this. It's not, valence is not defined as outer shell electrons. It does not equal outer shell. In Chem 4, you probably learned that valence equals outer shell electrons, right? In Chem 1A, we've got to modify that. The valence are the highest n electrons, the highest n. That's the Chem 1A definition. The core are the same as the Chem 1A. Core are what we call inner shell electrons. So now we've completed these two shells. Uh, the next electrons are going to go into the next shell. And the next shell, um, the 3s1, would be called um, sodium. And then we have mag magnesium. And then we just continue to fill this, right? Hun's rule. And we fill it. We fill the third shell. When we fill the third shell, what element are we? Argon. Argon's filled third shell. Is it stable? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we go to the fourth shell. And so let's take a look at the fourth shell. I'm going to spend more time talking about the fourth shell. Okay, so the first, second, and third shell are filled. And so when we get to the fourth shell, these are what we call the core, let's say. And now we're working with the valence. Here. So we got a 4s. And then we fill it like this. Actually, let me clean this up a little bit. We got our five three Ds and our three four Ds. Well, we can come up with the quantum numbers, you know, four zero zero. Actually, let's complete this one. We have the three two minus two three two minus one three two zero three two one three two two. All right, we'll go here. What's this element? That's going to be potassium, and then. Calcium, and then scandium. 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 How many valence electrons does scandium have? Okay, in the Chem 4 definition, three. In the Chem 1A definition, two. Okay. But, you know, it can pluck all three off. You know what the common charge of scandium is? Plus three. It loses all three electrons, including it loses two valence electrons and what we call one core electron. Why do we call this a core electron? Because... With each successive n, do you remember the most probable distance, how it changes, or the effective distance? Let's just talk about the effective distance. n equals 1, the effective distance is quite close to the nucleus, right? n equals 2, the effective distance is out there. Like for hydrogen, it's like four times out there, right? n equals 3, the effective distance is 9 times. And so for an n equals 3 orbital in the hydrogen atom, it's about 9 times 8 naught out from the nucleus, right? n equals 4 is actually, the effective distance is 16 times out. 
And so when we're thinking about, you know, what is closer to the nucleus as far as effective distance, even the four, even though the forest is more penetrating, when we're thinking about the effective distance, you know, where is the most probable distance of finding the electron? Then these three D are actually pretty close to the nucleus compared to the four. I mean, three would be nine times, four would be sixteen times. You know, in terms of uh, let's say uh, most probable or whatever distance, and so these are actually quite close, quite a bit closer, but they just can't penetrate as deeply as these. Does that make sense? Okay. And so um, it's weird, but that would be core, and this would be scandium, and then what comes next? Titanium. Now, the funny thing is, let's say you're an oxidizing agent. If you're an oxidizing agent, you're going you're gonna to want to pluck. You have two choices. Let me give you the two choices. You're an oxidizing agent. You pluck the electron nearest to you or the electron a little farther away, but easier to pluck. Okay, like say, you're, you're looking at an apple to pluck off a tree. There's an apple right here within reach. You grab that apple, but it's harder to pull off than an apple, like say, quite a bit higher. The apple up there is gonna be easier to pull off, right? But it's just kind of out of reach. So you gotta get a ladder to get it, right? But you know what? You're strong enough that you can pull off either. I'm strong enough I can pull off either because you know the difference. Between, what is the difference in energy between a 4s and a 3d? Is it a huge difference in energy? They're about just. It's just a hair easier to pull off the 3d than it is to pull off the 4s. But the 3d is so far away, that, and the 4s is right here. What are you going to do? Are you going to get the ladder? and pluck off the... No, if you're an oxidizing agent, what are you going to do? You're going to come here, you're going to ignore the 3D because those are too close to the nucleus, and you're going to pluck off the 4S. And so oddly enough, we're going to pluck off the electrons that are more stable and harder to, harder to pull off, but the reasoning is, yeah, as further away, you're going to pluck off the outermost electrons. What are the outermost electrons? The 4S. And so, oddly enough, the 4S electrons get pulled by the oxidizing agent before the 3Ds, and then the 3Ds get pulled. Because once you pluck off the, the 4S, then the next outermost electron would be the 3D, right? And so, think about the transition metals. The transition metals have variable charge. What is the, one of the common charges of transition metals? Plus two. Why plus two? Because you, first you pluck off these electrons here, the outermost, or what we call the valence electron. And then, well, these cores aren't too hard to pluck off because are these cores, like these cores, you know, you got that filled symmetry, you got that spherical symmetric electron cloud. You know, this electron cloud looks like a, a ball. No, this is, you know, this isn't that stable. And so these, even though these are core, what we consider core, they aren't that hard to pluck off. But after we pluck these off, then these can, are considered the valence. So pluck these two off, now we've got these as the valence, which are originally core. And so for titanium, let me tell you the common charges of titanium. For titanium, plus two is not that common. But plus two, we could have, we could have plus three and plus four. Do you know what the most common charge for titanium is? plus four. Scandium, scandium is not a variable charge. Scandium is fixed charge. You know what the fixed charge is? Plus three. Plus three. Vanadium, vanadium is variable charge. Do you know what the charge on vanadium, the common charges on vanadium are? Plus, well the first is plus two, plus three, plus four, and plus five. So vanadium shows those variable charges, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and plus 5 in its compounds. Depends on the strength of the oxidizer, you know, what's plucking those electrons off. Is to pluck off five electrons, is that something that's easy to do? 
No, it actually, um, there, it, it gets successively harder. Each time you try to pluck an electron off, it gets harder. Why? Well, it's like each time somebody steals something from you, you're going to try to make it harder, right? And so this is the same thing with the nucleus. Each time the electron gets plucked off, the remaining electrons get held even tighter because there's less negative charge with the same amount of positive charge. And so the electrical attraction is going to be stronger. Well, anyway, um, this is vanadium, and then after vanadium comes chromium. But chromium is funny because um, chromium is, did you guys memorize this in Chem 4? Chromium is an exception. Why is it an exception? Yeah. Yeah. This is what we predict based on the off bow principle. Fill the lowest energy orbitals first. But chromium has an exception because this electron in the S goes over to the D. And so the chromium has a half-filled S and a half-filled D. And so you have to memorize this. And so what is the reason for this? Did you guys memorize some kind of reason for this? It's more stable. It's more stable kicking an electron from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital. No. That's not more stable. It's going to cost you energy to kick an electron from this orbital to a higher energy orbital. Yeah, Letha? Huh? Yes, there are two exceptions. I'll talk about the next one very soon. It, close. What's the reason for this? It costs you energy. This costs energy, but what is the return? You know, if it just costs, 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 then you're going to get tired, right? Everything, you, you got to get some kind of return for paying. And so what is the return here? Yeah, right. The return is the stability of the half-filled D-cell. And so the benefit here is the half fill D subshell or sublevel. So what's the big deal? You know, who cares about a half filled D subshell? It's not a filled one, right? But you know, it shares the same benefit of the filled one, that is, it has that what we call spherical symmetry. It's isotropic and all and isotropic is balanced, isn't it? in all three dimensions versus anisotropic, which is tilted one way or the other, depending on where you are in space. But you don't have to call it, you know, isotropic or anisotropic. You just call it what? Yeah, the spherical symmetry, the, the stability of the half-filled D subshell comes from that spherical symmetry. That is having the electron cloud as a sphere versus having a slice of pi missing. Because this is like here. You have five slices, you, but one slice is missing. There's some empty space there. And usually ele electron clouds are like fog or they're like water. You know, they try to fill up the space if they can. You know, they fill up the space to spread out from each other. Question. Uh-huh. Is the same thing going to happen uh, the atom below chromium? Yes. So the question is, does this happen for molybdenum? Yes. This exact same thing happens for molybdenum. Because here we have two S electrons and four D electrons. And so what we do is we take one of the S electrons and move it to the D, and then we get five D electrons, which is 
half bill. And so molybdenum, yes. But you know, the bigger these atoms get, the less it matters. You know, or let's see. In other words, there are, there are a number of exceptions in here. And so will it happen for tungsten? I'm not sure. We could check it and see. But for sure, it can't happen for molybdenum. Because of the space. You know, when you get to these large d orbitals, you know. The volume of the d orbitals is quite big, so the electrons kind of spread out as is, right? And so if there's a chunk missing, et cetera, and just to put it in simple terms. But what should you know? You should know chromium is an exception, molybdenum is an exception. You'd expect tungsten to be in exception as well. Uh, that's all we can say. We'd have to verify this with experimental data. And what does the experimental data tell us? These, you know, when we have these parallel spins like this, you know what it does? It creates a magnetic interaction. Um, and so uh, it creates magnetic interaction with external magnetic fields. So you can actually measure. In chromium, it's been measured by experiment. By experiment. They, they have something called a Gouillet balance, where they uh, measure the interaction between the atom and, and then the external magnetic field. By experiment, chromium has six unpaired electrons. <coughs> six unpaired electrons per atom. And so, you know, this is by um, experiment. In fact, you know, what came first? <laughs> what, actually, what came first? Let me ask you this. Did somebody predict this theoretically, saying, hmm, oh, half-filled D-sub shell. This is going to be an exception. Let's test it and see. Do you think that came first? Or somebody measured it and said, whoa, six unpaired electrons? I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting only four unpaired electrons. What do you think? It's the second one. And the second one. And so this is what we call an ad hoc. You know what ad hoc means? This is another fancy word, but it's very common in science, so you might as well get used to these words. Ad hoc means after the fact. It's easy to explain things after the fact, isn't it? Right? After the fact. Unfortunately, we have lots of ad hoc things, you know, after the fact that we got to modify our description uh, right if if the calculations weren't so difficult then we wouldn't have so much ad hoc stuff we'd probably just figure it out right doing a calculation but anyway um, what's another exception so memorize chromium is an exception after chromium then things behave as you'd expect and so chromium was uh, this. What comes after chromium? Okay, what are some charges for chromium? What is what do you think the maximum positive oxidation state for chromium is? <coughs> plus plus six. Do you think we'd go plus seven on chromium? No, because if you go on to plus seven, you'd be taking a core electron. If you take a core electron, you're gonna mess up this beautiful Spherically symmetric set of orbitals. Um, so plus six would be the max, but typically chromium is plus two, plus three, etc. Plus four, plus five, plus six. Chromium plus six, you think is highly reactive or not? Not very reactive, highly stable. Highly reactive. Highly reactive. If you look at our uh, redox chart there, and you look at dichromate, dichromate is plus six for chromium. It's highly reactive, powerful oxidizer. After chromium comes manganese. Manganese um, has one more electron. That's just going to go back and fill the 4s. So this is manganese, and then iron. Cobalt, nickel, copper. Wait, let's stop here. Let's stop at nickel. 
look what I could do with nickel. With nickel, if I take these two electrons and then promote them up here, I could fill my D. Does it happen? No, it doesn't happen. Why? Well, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it, must, it must be too much energy, you know, and not enough return. Too much cost, too little benefit. But with copper, copper, what is the cost? The cost is promoting one electron. What is the benefit? Filling my 3D. For copper, this is exception number two you have to memorize. And so this is copper. Copper, memorize. It's going to have 10 D electrons. That's even better than a half fill. A completely filled D sublevel or D subshell is much better than a half fill. In fact, um, what is a charge, one of the charges for copper? Plus one. Plus one is a common charge for copper. What's the most common charge for copper? Plus two. If, if, if plus one's easy because we lose the 4s. But plus two seems screwed up because plus two would ruin this nice symmetry here. And now I got a slice of the pie missing. And so why is that? That doesn't make sense, does it? No. And so later on, um, some people figured this stuff out. And Chem 1B will talk about it. There's something else stabilizing this. If this were the case, then plus two would never happen for copper. Plus two would never happen. But there's something else for copper that changes things and makes it stable. And that is these orbitals, the d orbitals, lose their degeneracy and rearrange. But that's for chem 1b. But copper is a bit unusual. But anyway, copper does form plus one, so that makes sense. But what's below copper? Silver behaves as you'd expect. Silver is going to have a filled D and one electron in the 4s. What is the charge on silver? Plus 1. And is there a plus 2 for silver? No. And that means the 4D subshell does not want to break. And so silver behaves as you'd expect. Plus 1 only. Wait, so here would be copper again? Copper is. All right. The exception is is this. The exception is um, we take an S electron and fill the D. And so it looks weird here. We call this electron configuration 4S1 3D10. It should have been 4S2 3D9. It should have been, but it wasn't. And the reason is, is because one of the S electrons was promoted to D at the cost, but the benefit was that the D got filled. And so that's the exception. Exception number one. Now, the other thing is that copper should only be a plus one ion because it should cost too much energy to break this D subshell. You know, versus half filled is easier to break, but this should be more difficult. But it turns out that copper. So most common charge is not plus one, it is plus two. And the reason for that, you'll learn later. But based on this, it doesn't make any sense. That's all I'm saying. Now, silver makes sense because silver is going to have the same type of exception. It's going to be four, not four S. Silver will be five S, one electron, and four D, ten electrons. And so silver will lose the 5s easily, but it won't want to break the 4d. And so silver behaves nicely. We don't have to learn or come up with some ad hoc interpretation of why silver is plus 2, because it isn't. Silver is only plus 1. Silver is fixed charge. What else is fixed charge? Zinc and cadmium. Do you know what the charge on zinc is? 
It's only plus two. That's it. And so if we look at zinc, why is zinc only plus two? This is zinc. Zinc is forest two is filled, three D ten three D is filled. Forest two three D ten is the electron configuration. And so if zinc, you know, if an oxidizer comes along, it's gonna pluck these electrons first. And will the oxidizer oxidizer are gonna to try to pluck these electrons, right? But it's going to be hard because it would have to break that symmetry. Does that make sense? And so zinc is always plus two. Cadmium is the same. Um, it's rather, it's only five s and four d. But cadmium has this filled s, filled d. Cadmium is only going to be plus two, plus two because these are now like you would expect. Core electrons are typically filled, right? But um, for the transition metals, sometimes the core electrons aren't in a filled set of orbitals. All right, um, I guess we're out of time. I just uh, needed to get into chapter nine, but this is already, we're already talking about chapter nine stuff. We're talking about chapter nine stuff with the oxidizing agents and ions. Uh huh. Next week, week from tomorrow, right? Tuesday's the holiday. So uh, Tuesday's the holiday, no class. Tomorrow, since I'm behind schedule, tomorrow's lab, I'm going to use some of the time for lecture, and then we're going to do some plotting. Some of you haven't finished the uh, calorimetry plots, so I'll help you guys with those. Okay.